Hey everyone. Before we begin, I wanted to say a massive thank you to the author, C.D. Kester. This man has been immensely patient and understanding with me throughout the months and months of bringing his story to life. He has recently released the audiobook version of The Bunker, and we would both be incredibly appreciative if you all would consider checking it out. Link is in the description. Anyway, this has been Invita 22. I'm gonna go sleep for about a decade. I hope you all enjoy. The smell of bacon roused me from my sleep. Mother was so good to us. There was not a single morning that she did not have something hot for us to eat as we awoke. As I lifted myself up in the bed, I felt my hair brush against my thighs and stretched my arms out wide. Having my hair braided and being dressed for the day before she finished cooking was paramount. Disappointing her was the worst feeling that could ever be had. My sisters hurried around the room, each of them working on a different part of their morning routine. I sat with my sister, Abigail, at her bed, and she began to twist my hair into shape. She and I were partners every morning. We held each other accountable to be awake on time and made sure that we were presentable before we sat at the table. Wendy, my eldest sister, came up to me and asked me to button up her dress. I did so without hesitation and patted her on both shoulders as I finished. See you at the table, I said, as she thanked me and walked out of the room. Wendy was always the early bird, eager to help mother with breakfast and have all of our places set for us before we arrived. Stop turning your head, Abigail said as she jerked my back straight by pulling my hair. Okay, okay. Jeez, Abigail. You sure seem cranky this morning. Is something bothering you? I responded to her quizzically, and rubbed the back of my head where my hair had been yanked. Oh, it's nothing. At least I think it's nothing. We don't have time, Madison. And there's still so much to do. She answered my query tersely. It was obvious that she was not up to speak about it for the time being. She even called me Madison instead of Maddie, which she only did if she was upset, so I left it for later. We shared everything with each other, so she would surely give me the details when she was ready and willing. We quickly finished our braids and helped each other get into our dresses. I reached into my dress pockets and felt the smooth stone that had our favorite scripture painted onto it. John 8-7 uh, Abby and I had made matching ones for each other as a sort of reminder to not be so hard on ourselves. I kept it on me, always, and I hoped that Abby got even half as much comfort from hers as I did from mine. When we arrived at the table, Mother was still laboring over the bacon and omelets for all seven of us. Wendy was setting down a glass of orange juice at each of our spots. I thanked her as she sat mine in front of me. I couldn't help but notice a shifty look on Abigail's face, which was unlike my sister. She was a morning person, and always exuded joy and cheerfulness during our early routines. Uh, I believe Mother picked up on it as well, because she began to look at her suspiciously. She called out to her from the stove. Abigail, dear, would you mind fetching my bonnets from the bedroom? It is right on top of my bedside table. Abby hunched towards me and whispered before standing. Look inside your pillowcase. After rising, she answered in a louder tone. Yes, mother, but right away. She walked off with a distant and cold look upon her face. I could have sworn that I even saw her trembling. While I began to ponder what could be affecting my beloved sister so seriously, I heard mother speak again. She was not talking to us directly, but obviously wanted us to hear what she was saying. I moved that bonnet into the closet. I better go tell Abigail. After she muttered this, she followed Abby towards her bedroom, and Wendy took over handing out everybody's food. After all of our plates were full and the table was ready, we waited patiently for Mother and Abigail. We knew better than to eat before everyone had arrived. The other girls began to talk quietly amongst themselves, but I had too much on my mind to join with them. Mother came back from her room, still not wearing her bonnet, and took her seat at the table. Abigail is not feeling well. She will not be joining us for breakfast this morning. She asked me to pass along her apologies, she said to all of the sisters. I did my best to keep a straight face, 
but I was terrified on the inside. I knew when Abby was sick, and that was not what was wrong with her right now. We knew each other better than anyone, and almost had a psychic type of connection. Something was amiss, but I had to bide my time to understand what was happening. Madison, Clarissa, you both have hardly touched your omelets. You will need all your strength, so eat up. We have a big day today, Mother cheerfully said to us. Of course, Mother. Thank you for a lovely meal, I responded. It was of the utmost importance that I kept up the charade of my being oblivious. Mother knew how close Abigail and I were, and would be monitoring me closely, if there truly was something terribly wrong. I hurriedly finished my plate, and helped gather everyone's dishes to bring to the sink. Wendy and Chastity were happily washing the dishes as I helped gather them. I left the dining area, and was the first to return to our large communal bedroom. As I did, I went straight from my bed and reached into my pillowcase, feeling around at a feverish pace. I felt what seemed to be a folded up note, and rushed to put it in my dress pocket alongside Abby's stone before anyone walked into the room. I heard a few of my sisters approaching and reached to my bedside, reached to my bedside table to grab my Bible and notebook. Gretchen and Mildred strolled in, heading to their respective beds and gathered up their Bibles and notebooks as well. I made the act of joining them seem as natural as possible as we went together into the main gathering room. The sisters slowly began to filter in and turn the pages of their Bibles while jotting down things here and there in their notebooks. Finally, once all the sisters had arrived and settled in, Mother came and spoke to all of us. Let's begin our morning meditation, girls. We can start the process by saying what it is we are most thankful for. As always, Wendy, dear, would you like to start? Of course, Mother. I'm thankful for having such a wonderful and caring mother. We are so blessed to have you taking care of us every day and night. A typical answer from Wendy. It seemed that most days she used some form of flattery to express her gratitude. I couldn't help but notice Abigail was still absent from the group. I was beginning to be overtaken by dark suspicions. Chastity was the next to chime in for morning meditations. I am so grateful for our home. Uh, we're lucky to have never seen the horrors and profanities that lie outside of this place. You are surely right about that, my dear. Mother chimed in. Chastity continued. I had another uh, night terror last night. I was dreaming of those wretched creatures that Mother has spoken of from the outside world. The men uh, who want nothing more than to abuse us and defile our pure souls. It's just so horrible to imagine... I she broke off into sobs, and was rushed over to by Gretchen and Mildred. They held her and reassured her that all was going to be all right. I took this moment to make my move. If you all will excuse me, I need to use the restroom. I'll be right back. Hurry back, Madison. We will be continuing shortly, Mother replied, before going over to check on Chastity herself. I nodded as I walked off hurriedly. The restroom was down the same hallway as Mother's room, which was where Abigail was supposed to be. I quietly walked past the restroom and crept into Mother's room. Abby was nowhere to be found, not on the bed as we were told, or in her closet. My blood ran cold as I realized the deceit. I remembered the last thing that Abby said to me, and pulled the note out of my dress pocket. Folded up inside of the paper was a picture. It was seven girls that looked just like us. They had their hair braided the same as ours. Their dresses were so strikingly similar that I was almost certain they were the exact same ones. I moved the picture to the side and read what Abby had scrawled on the paper. I found this while clearing Mother's room. I'm sure there is some kind of reasonable explanation, but I can't work up the guts to ask her about it. Maybe we can do it together. It always makes me feel better to have you by my side. Tell me what you think. Love. Abigail. I began to back away in horror when I felt myself bump into something solid and felt warm breath on the back of my neck. Madison, darling, we're waiting for you at morning meditation. My pulse began to race and a cold sweat began to form on my forehead. I used my best sleight of hand while trying to hide the contents of the note from Mother. I I'm sorry, Mother. 
I thought I would check on Abigail after I finished in the restroom. I assume she must have moved back to her own bed, I said, ending my thoughts with an audible gulp and noticeably trembling. Oh, dear, dear, dear. There's no need to worry about Abigail in the slightest. Do you know what the Bible says about sacrifice, my dear Madison? Mother asked, but gave me no time to answer. She began to pace beside me and slowly started circling me as I stood frozen in fear. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Luke 9.24 A beautiful scripture, isn't it, Madison? You see, today is the day that my lovely daughters will be able to do the most glorious thing that one can for the Lord. They will lay down their very lives to glorify his name. You will have new heavenly bodies. Gone will be the sins and vices of the flesh. You girls will be awaiting your mother in paradise, where the streets are paved with gold, far, far away from all of the evil of this forsaken world. Her voice was soothing, even though not a word she said had the same effect. I reached my hands into my dress pockets to better conceal the notes and picture. It was then that I felt Abby's stone in my hand. I thought of the comfort that Abigail had always brought me, and I thought of what terror she must be in right now. Mother, where is Abigail? I said coldly. She stopped circling me and looked me dead in the eyes before answering. She is with Jesus now, Madison. Before you know it, the rest of my beautiful daughters will be right there beside her. Emboldened by hearing this statement, I snatched the stone up with a firm grip and struck it down on the top of Mother's head. I lifted and dropped the stone more times than I can remember, crying as I did in remembrance of my loving sister. I sobbed as I locked Mother's door and went to the place that none of us were supposed to know about, the place where Mother would leave to get our food or any other necessities. I saw her go to it when I was supposed to be taking a nap in her bed many years ago. In the back of her closet, somehow, she made the wall open and ascended into a hatch that presumably went into the outside world. As I got back into the closet, I shoved her clothes to the side and saw a pin pad in the corner of the wall. I typed in the numbers to Mother's favorite Bible verse, Revelations 13.13. 13. The door clicked and came open as I entered this, and I shoved through and made my way to the ladder and climbed into the hatch. There was a large wheel at the top that I spun as quickly as I could until there was no more spinning left to do. When I reached this point, I pushed upward and lifted the heavy lid. It was that moment that I saw the sunlight for the first time in my life. It was warm and wonderful, and it made my skin tingle with a sensation that I had never experienced before. I had heard about it and read about it in books, but nothing could compare to feeling it on your skin for yourself first hand. I grasped my stone from my sweet sister, and I held on to it like a small girl holds on to a baby doll when she is awoken from a bad dream. I took one step, and then another, and I continued to walk the only way that I could, forward into the great unknown. I had been walking for so long. I had experienced exhaustion and hunger like I had never known in my life. I was plagued throughout the entire journey by invasive and overbearing thoughts that consumed me. Was my mother dead or alive? Was she even really my mother? Or had we been fooled for our whole lives? My sisters had surely discovered her by now. What in the world must they be thinking of me right now? Finally, the most prominent thought that ate away at me was about my poor, sweet sister, Abigail. How she had been brought to death far too early, and how that was the fate that awaited all of us if I had not acted. Hopefully, my sisters would believe the truth and realize this was what had to be done. I saw something in the distance. It was the first semblance of any life I had come across since I left the bunker. It was a man, at least I was fairly certain that it was a man, 
He was riding on a large green machine out in a field of what appeared to be wheat. I screamed out to him for help, sobbing with joy at the prospect of being saved. The man stopped his machine and ran over to me. He had a big cowboy hat on and was wearing a flannel shirt with blue jeans and boots. What are you doing out here, little missy? You look like a herd of wild hogs got a hold of you and dragged you down a dirt road. He gently held my shoulder and began to lead me in the direction of his machine. Once he realized how weak I was, he put his head under my arm and helped to make the walk a bit easier on me. I wanted to talk to him, but I didn't know what to say. I told him the only thing I was sure of at the moment in a winded effort. I need help. Well, that's for sure, sweet pea. Don't you worry, we're going to get you all the help you need. I guarantee it. His voice was calm and reassuring. When we made it to his machine, there was a vehicle beside it. A truck, I believe. Lights blue with white accents. It read Chevrolet on the back in all capital letters. Hop in, darling. I'ma get you over to Pastor Robert's place. It's not a long ride from here. He walked me over and opened the door so I could make my way into the passenger side. When he made his way in and shut the door, I asked him a question. Where am I? Well, you're in a small town of Fern Hollow, Texas, honey. Wandered over from a direction where there's no other town for a real good ways. He started up the truck and moved the stick in the center, kicking up dust as we took off. I started to try and speak again, but had a coughing fit and grabbed my head as everything started to spin. Take it easy, darling. You just go ahead and lay back in that chair and rest up for a bit. Once we make it to the pastor's place, we'll get you all fed, bathed, and all dressed up in some clean clothes. After you get some of your strength back, we can worry about all the details. He spat some brown liquid into a plastic bottle and placed it in the cup holder. I was able to manage a weak reply, saying thank you, and nothing else. As soon as I leaned the chair back, I drifted straight to sleep. Murderer. You're a murderer. Look what you've done to our dear mother. How could you do this? You will pay for your sins, Madison. Wendy spewed venom into my face with Gretchen and Mildred close behind. Chastity was cowering in the corner and crying, with Clarissa stroking her head to reassure her. You always were the black sheep of the family. And this is what we get for not dealing with you sooner. Well, that's okay. But now... It's time for us to deal with you. Hatred filled Wendy's eyes as all of the sisters surrounded me. They each held large knives in their hands. All I could do was back away and plea bargain until I felt a thump. Warm breath came onto my neck and I turned around, horrified at what I saw. My mother was standing behind me, her face bashed in and disfigured. She looked just like how I had left her lying there on the cold stone floor. You will pay for your sins, Madison. The ghoul who I once called my mother spat at me. I woke up screaming and began sobbing almost instantaneously. It's all right, darling. You're just having yourself a real bad dream. Toss and turn the whole time. We're just about here to the church. I'll help you out when we pull up. The man was reassuring and helped calm my nerves as much as was possible. When we pulled up to the little church, the man came around the truck and opened the door. He took my arm over his head and helped as I staggered with him towards the building. Once we were through the door, an elderly gentleman came rushing over from the other side of the room. Dear Lord, what has happened, Alan? Where has this poor girl come from? The pastor was visibly shaken and came over to help guide me. This man, apparently Alan, who brought me this far, responded. Not sure yet. She came walking from that old dirt road down next to my wheat fields. All I know is she needs a hot meal, a bath, and a change of clothes. Well, she is surely in the right place for that. Poor thing. Right this way. We made it to the other side of the worship room to the door that he had come from. There was a bath and a bedroom, and I could tell it was where the nice old man lived and spent his time studying while not preaching the gospel. Alan helped me take a seat on the bed while the pastor grabbed a set of clothes and a towel for me from a closet that was stacked with clean clothes, toys, and blankets. 
After stacking the items in the bathroom on the counter, he ran me a glass of water out of the bathroom sink. He handed the water to me and made his way back through the room, stopping at the door to speak for a moment before continuing through. Fresh clothes and a towel in from donation are waiting for you, as soon as you feel up to washing up. I'm going to go straight to the kitchen and throw something together to ease your hunger, child. Alan had taken a seat in the pastor's chair. It was a large-backed mahogany and burgundy chair that sat next to a small desk with an open Bible and a notepad with a pen beside it. So, you think I can get a little bit of backstory here? Maybe a name to go with it? I took a sip of water and then took a deep breath. I'm not sure how to best sum up my situation. I explained it to him the best that I could. My name is Madison. I have six sisters uh, who will all need help before long. Uh, well, uh, five sisters now, I guess. I stopped and fought tears back for a moment before continuing. They all have their necessities for the time being, but once they run out, they will not be able to fend for themselves. A mother had always provided for us, but my late sister uncovered something sinister that was in mother's past. This, unfortunately for Abigail, turned out to be her plans for the present as well. I took the stone in the picture with the notes out of my dress pocket and handed them to Alan. He looked at me in horror and confusion when he felt and saw the blood upon the stone. These seven girls were dressed just as my sisters and I and Abigail had found it in Mother's room and began to suspect something. When Abby went missing and I tried to find her, Mother explained the whole thing. We were to be sacrificed, and I was already too late to save my beloved sister. This was too much for me to bear, and I struck her down with this stone, which was a symbol of my sister and I's friendship. Going over this was far too painful, and I broke down in tears. Alan came over and patted me on the back while letting me cry into his shoulder. It's all right now. You did what you had to. There wasn't no way around it, Madison. After a moment, he returns to his seat and looked over the picture, note, and the bloody stone. The first thing he commented on was the stone, the one that matched the one my favorite sister kept before Mother took her away. John 8-7, huh? Let he without sin cast the first stone. That one has always been a favorite of mine, too. Tragic that you had to use it for such a horrible task. He then turned his attention to the picture and perked up considerably. I've seen this before. He held up the picture, slowly nodding his head while drifting off deep into thought. Margaret, was that your mother's name? I, I never asked mother's name, and she never told us. I guess I never even realized that she would have another name. He continued. Margaret Sutherland. She would come by the church very seldom. When she did, though, she always would come asking for donations. She needed food, clothes, Bibles, you name it. Anything the good parishioners of this here church would provide, she would take. Of course, we didn't get too many chances out here to take care of folks, uh, Fern Hollow being as small as it is. So, when your mother came out here searching for help, town came together like you wouldn't believe. We would gather together everything that we could to send her off with every time that she came. I offered to help her get the stuff back to where she was going. She always turned us down. Many years ago, Margaret showed me that picture, said it was of her daughter's. That's the closest I ever got to any personal information about her. She was an incredibly private woman, and now I can see why. He shook his head remorsefully and handed me back my personal items. You get yourself washed up and changed, Madison. Pastor's grub has to be just about finished. I'm sure he could eat a whole horse right now. With this being said, he walked out of the room, closing the door behind him to give me some privacy. I went to the bathroom and started the hot water. The dress that the pastor left for me was exactly like the one I had been wearing, exactly like the one from the picture of the other seven girls. This made me feel uneasy. I knew that Alan said that they had basically given Mother everything that she had. 
I know that Alan said that they had basically given Mother everything that she had. I found it quite strange that they would still have more of the same type of dress they had given her all those years ago. My hunger drove me to not question it too much. I had to get something to eat. I was starving. The mother may have been a twisted individual, but one thing she never did was let us go hungry. I bathed and changed into the eerily similar clothing before heading to the kitchen. There I was met by Pastor Robert, sitting at an empty table and staring at me intently. Now, Alan. In an instant, I felt my hands being pulled behind me and bound tightly by what felt like a thick rope. I was too weak to fight, and he was too strong even if I wasn't. I gave in and allowed myself to be captured, giving the pastor a look that I was hoping could burn a hole through his head. Oh, don't be so feisty, Madison. I might as well be your father if you've thought all this time that Margaret was your mother. I remember when you were just a little girl, two years old, and Alan here helped me snatch you out of that supermarket. Yes, I dare say I never thought that I would see you again, my dear. But you have proven yourself to be a fighter. Alan, why don't you show Miss Madison where we'd like to keep our fighters? With that, he tugged me by the arm with brute force, a far cry from the tender helping hand he had shown me earlier. On the wall, there was a large cross from the floor to the ceiling. Alan pressed on a certain section that gave in and turned into a handle. This secret door led to a set of stone stairs that were dimly lit and menacing. We walked down the stairs, and there were rows of cages along either side of the walls. They were filled with girls who appeared to be around the same age as myself and my sisters. Most of them hardly looked up, while some looked at me with a sense of what I could only describe as hopelessness. I felt a bit of that same feeling starting to creep into me as well, until I heard something that made my heart skip a beat. Maddie! I knew that voice anywhere. It was Abigail. I saw her in a cage, shaking the bars and waving to get my attention. Alan spoke as he jerked me into a cage across from her. Y'all can be right by each other for all I care. That way you can see the face on the other, when you realize there ain't a hope in the world. He slammed the door shut and locked it tightly with a chain and padlock. Oh darn, Madison. Where are my manners? We said we was giving you some dinner, didn't we? Alan took the slimy tobacco out of his lip and threw it at the ground in front of my feet. Chow down, sweet pea. He laughed a disgusting and evil laugh as he walked away, thrilled with what he had thought was an incredible joke. I didn't care about any of that. The only person I cared about at this very moment was in the cage right across from me. Abby, uh, what in the world are you doing here? I thought that you were dead. Uh, Mother told me you were. I'm sure that she thought that I was. As you know, I was on to her little plan, and I noticed a bottle of cyanide powder in her hiding spot next to her bed. I swapped it out with some powdered sugar when I had the chance. When she called me into the other room before breakfast, I knew what she was planning to do. She got me to take what she said was medicine and had me lay in the extra room because she suddenly thought I looked sick, which I knew was bogus. As soon as she left me there and I heard her going back to the table, I made my way out of her secret hatch. The rest of my journey probably looks a lot like the one that you just went through. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but more importantly, I couldn't believe my eyes. I was so happy to have my sister back that I knew nothing would ever tear us apart again. We were going to get out of there. We had to. I looked at her confidently, and as her gaze met mine, I knew exactly what we had to do. Abby, let's get out of here. I shoved my hand into my pocket and held up my stone. She beamed and held up her matching one. I reached my arm through the cage and began to smash the padlock with it. Abby saw me doing it and began to do the same with hers. Once the locks were off, we returned our stones to their respective pockets and pulled the chains off the cages. I took my chain from my cage to carry with me as a weapon, and Abigail did the same. We marched forward, unafraid of our assailants, and empowered by each other's company. The girls in the cages beside us were beginning to look full of hope and vigor. They called out to us in hushed tones, and we assured them that we would be back to help them escape as well. We crept up the stairs and made it through the secret doorway. Alan's voice was coming from the kitchen. 
It sounded like he was talking on the phone, because there was never an answer to the things that he said. I nodded to Abby, and we moved in unison, like a couple of lionesses hunting a wildebeest. As we reached our prey, I came up behind him and pulled the chain tightly around his throat. He gurgled and reached his fingers towards the chain. When he tried to start reaching back for me, Abby gave him a crack across the head with her stone. This left him unable to struggle as I finished the job that had to be done. I made sure that he had not moved for a minute or so before loosening the chain at all. I then checked to make sure he had no pulse and looked up to Abby. We both knew what came next. Pastor Robert. We went towards his room cautiously as we knew he must have been alerted to our presence. Right on cue, the pastor came out with a shotgun pointing at the two of us. Drop the chains, girls. We did so, and awaited our fate. Losing those chains is a bit symbolic, I think, because I have an offer for the two of you that I think you would find quite liberating. It is the same offer, in fact, that we made to the one that you call Mother many years ago. Virgin sacrifice is one of the oldest traditions in the world, girls. It has always been around, and whether the world knows it or not, it will always be around. Because the two of you have fought so valiantly, I am willing to give you the opportunity to continue our glorious tradition. The rewards will be so great that there is no way for you to fathom them in your worldly mind. You will become like goddesses, with more power in this life and the next than you could have ever imagined. Of course, you can imagine how much better this all sounds when you consider the alternative. He cocked the shotgun and pointed it at us, awaiting an answer. So, that is all that you offered her? Abigail spat at him. What a load of crap. Do you think I believe any of that for one second? I thought better of Mother than that. Of course, after recent events, I know that I really never knew her at all. I understood what she was doing, and I began to slowly make my way a bit further from her. Pastor Roberts pointed the gun at her intently and called out, Think of what you are doing, girl. You are choosing death over life. Do not be a fool. As he said this, as he said this, I called out from where I now stood. No, we choose life. I threw my stone with all my force at the side of his head, and he went down in a heap. After I grabbed the gun from the ground, I ran over to Abigail, finally able to embrace her and tell her how happy I was that we had found each other. Once we both promised to never let the other one get lost again, we turned our attention back to the pastor. I had a certain cage in mind for him, one with a first-class meal cooked up by his personal chef. The boy ran through the field with his model airplane in his hand. He was wearing his favorite aviation goggles, leather hat, and his scarf to top it all off. He felt like a real-life pilot as he ran around with the wind blowing in his face. As he moved the model plane up and down through the wind, he made a noise which, to him, sounded like the engine of a plane. He had been out playing for hours. The only thing that could get him to stop was the inevitable winding down of daylight. There were no lights in the field, so he had learned the hard way that if he stayed out past dark, he would have a tough and spooky time finding his way home for supper. As the day wore on and the sun began to fade, the boy began to captain his plane towards a landing at home base. He arrived at his home just a bit before dusk. The sun was a beautiful shade of red and orange. What the boy saw at his front door caused him to stop making airplane noises. In fact, the boy dropped his plane on the patio and felt a feeling in his stomach that was similar to falling. Bloody footprints were coming out of the front door, and the door was wide open. The carnage that awaited him was nothing that a child should ever have to witness. The blood was like a pool underneath his slain mother and father. With a broken heart, the boy cried with his parents' bodies, repeatedly asking them to please wake up and telling them he loved them. That little boy was me, a little over twenty years ago now. My parents were murdered by a man with an axe, at least, the detectives presumed it was a man, uh, due to the brute force that was exerted that fateful day. 
That day shaped the rest of my life in so many ways. I became very introverted and stuck to mainly reading books or using computers. This led to my eventual career choice of becoming a hacker. Not the bad kind, though. My job is to catch the bad kind of hackers. I think it is my thirst for justice that stems from the murders that drives me to continually grow better at my job and put the bad guys away. Kind of like I'm trying to fill an empty void in a way for the unsolved taking of my parents. I try not to dwell on the past too often, but this time of year it gets hard not to. It is getting close to the anniversary of the day they were murdered, August 20th. I have been considering doing something to get out of the house and try to get my mind off the subject. Maybe I could get to a movie or out to eat somewhere nice. Maybe I could go to a movie or out to eat somewhere nice. I toss these kinds of ideas around every year around this time. The result is always the same, though. A depressing night in with a movie marathon and a bottle of my favorite gin. That is a problem for later, though. I still have two days until I have to worry about that night. For now, I'm just going to focus on my work and try to keep my mind off the inevitable. I know I said that I catch the bad guys, but the main part of my day-to-day -day job is finding ways to exploit different companies' systems to help them better secure themselves against the bad guys. The technical terms are white hats for ethical hackers and black hats for the bad ones. Right now, I am working on the system for an airline company trying my best to break into their financial systems to find their areas of weakness. Ironic that it would be an airline company while leading into the anniversary. I always associate planes and flying with that day. The police said that the murderer was not gone from the scene when I discovered my parents there. I often wonder if he was somewhere uh, watching me through a window. I wonder if he saw in my eyes what he had done to me and what that meant to him. Was he happy about it? Did he have other reasons for killing them, and felt bad for me? One thing is for sure. He made the decision to let me live. I have stayed up countless nights, thinking of how that would be the biggest mistake he ever made if I were to find him. This airline, Southern Continental, was the only one that came anywhere close to the small town that my parents were murdered in. We lived in a very remote community in the panhandle, known as Fern Hollow. After that, I started bouncing around between foster families. I ended up here, in the much larger city of Fairmont, in the southeastern part of the state. Of course, uh, most cities would seem to be much larger when compared to Fern Hollow. That was the type of place that only had one of anything. Uh, one grocery store, one gas station, one church. It is very particular that the job I am working this close to their death day would be the same airline that anyone coming in and out of that area would have to use. My wheels were spinning now. I couldn't just go into the flight records of this company. As good as I am, there was still no way to do it without leaving traces. I could be prosecuted and blacklisted in the industry. It could be the end of a life that I had worked so hard to gain. The urge to find the man who did those unspeakable things to my parents outweighed my sense of self-preservation. My thirst for his justice was much stronger, and he would have to answer to me for what he did that day. I am going to investigate who flew into and out of the neighboring larger city beside Fern Hollow that week. Wait a sec. I found a man who came into the airport in Temple Bell on August 19th and left on August 20th. Ronald Sutherland of Athos, Colorado. I hear that Colorado is beautiful this time of year. I think I might just need some fresh mountain air. It was almost the anniversary again. In fact, tomorrow was the day. The nightmares have already started. I always have them the whole week before sometimes longer. The screaming, the blood, the poor little boy walking in and realizing what happens to his parents. The worst of all, though, are the dreams of my sweet little girl. Those bastards took her from me. I would never be able to go on living 
knowing that I knew where they were and still left them breathing. The poor little boy, though, the image of his broken heart showing through on his face. It will haunt me until the day that I die. He was as much a victim as my poor little Margaret. I hate to dwell on it, but it cannot be avoided when the date of my wretched deed draws near. Margaret was my everything. She was my beating heart that was ripped from my chest. Her mother, Carolyn, passed away while giving birth to her. She was my high school sweetheart, who I thought would be with me until the end. Margaret was the only piece of her that I had left, and I cherished and loved her with all of my heart. The day that she was taken will always be fresh on my mind, like a constant and taunting reminder of the cruelty of life. We were visited by my sister's family in Temple Bell, Texas. It was a full week of board games, incredible dinners, games for the kids, and all sorts of family fun. It was the day before we were going to leave to go back home. My sister, Teresa, wanted to show us the carnival that was in town. It had been in town for a few weeks, and she said that she and her kids had loved it every time they went. That Margaret was still a little young for the rides, but up until what happened, we were having a wonderful time. There was a big ball pit that was perfect for her age range, and some of my sister's kids, who were a bit too big for it, even joined in. Margaret insisted on wearing her favorite hats into the pit, even though I told her that she might lose it in there. We went back and forth on it for a moment, but finally, I relented and told her to just be careful and keep track of it. The back of the pit was up against a wooden area, but I didn't think much of it at the time. I did not notice the door in the back of the ball pit building either. These are the things that I can never stop beating myself up over. One moment she was safe and sound, having the time of her life, smiling and laughing right before me. The next, two strangers came in the back door of the pit and snatched her up. They were long gone before any of us were able to catch up. The man's face was covered with a bandana, and he wore sunglasses, so I could not make any kind of observation other than his short black hair, which was hardly visible due to the baseball cap. The woman was holding the door open for him, while he grabbed my Margaret. I was able to see even less about her features, only her blonde hair sticking out from under a cap as she took off behind the man. I thought before then that nothing could ever be worse than losing Carolyn. There was a bright side in Carolyn's death, though, no matter how much I refused to see it that way at the time. The bright side was our little Margaret, the light of my life. Carolyn gave her life to create a new one. There was no bright side in losing Margaret, though. No redeeming factor that could bring me even the slightest bit of solace. I worked with the police tirelessly. They explained that cases that aren't solved in the first 48 hours usually never will be. I tried every way that I could to find a lead for them. A suspect. Anything. It began to look hopeless, and they eventually began to treat it as a cold case. I would not accept that, though. I was not going to rest until I avenged the taking of my sweet little girl. I was sitting at a coffee shop in Temple Bell, looking for any information I could get about the carnival and the people who worked there. The police had already put plenty of time and effort into that front, but I felt like there might have been something that they missed. Maybe someone with a criminal history that matched the man's description. I was having no luck with this, but suddenly I had a strange feeling. A man was walking out of the coffee shop with a hat and sunglasses on. I felt drawn to him, like I had a bit of intuition pointing me in his direction. He walked up to the back of his SUV and took off his computer bag. When he popped the back of it, I saw something that got my heart racing a million miles a minute. Margaret's favorite hat tossed in the back of his trunk. I took down his license plate number as well as the make and the model of the vehicle. I was looking up his information before he even pulled out of the parking lot. He was Andrew Ash, married to Stephanie, and with a little boy named Jacob. I called the police and gave them all the new information. They told me that it would be a case that must be transferred over to the sheriff of Fern Hollow due to the culprits being in his jurisdiction. 
When I reached him on the phone, he spoke with a heavy southern drawl and was very brisk and dismissive about my daughter's case. Yeah, this Sheriff Hudson. No need to ramble on. I was already informed of your accusation. We're a small town of tight-knit folk here in Fern Hollow. I know the Ash family very well, and I can guarantee you that they did nothing of this sort. You want to come hash it out with me in person, you can be my guest. But we do not take this kind of slander and misinformation lightly. So be warned. I was crushed by this phone call. Crushed and enraged. If the sheriff of this little podunk town didn't want to do his job, then I was going to have to take justice into my own hands. I'd never been one to carry a gun. My sister and her husband did not keep them either. They did have a large axe in the garage, though. I grabbed it and snuck it into my car, just in case things got out of hand. Fern Hollow was a tiny little town. Very few stores and buildings. The houses were all out on their own huge plots of land out in the plains. I found the house that belongs to the Ash family and made my way around the side without drawing any attention. I saw them through the window. The man had black hair and the woman had blonde hair. Their body types appeared to be a match for the couple that snatched my daughter. As I saw this and remembered the hat in the man's trunk, I grabbed the axe and made my way to the back of the house. What happens next is the memory that keeps me up at night and wakes me up in cold sweats, screaming. I broke into the back of the house and cornered them in the room which I had seen them. I made it very clear that I was going to get my daughter back or they would be losing their lives. They defiantly told me that it was them who took my daughter. They said it was already too late and that she was long gone. They looked me in the face and told me there was no way I would ever be seeing my daughter again. That was the wrong answer. I left the scene a bloody mess. I walked out of the front door, leaving a trail of bloody footprints the whole way out. As I made it to the side, I heard something that made my heart sink. The sound of a little boy making airplane noises and romping up to the front of the house. I watched through the window from the side of the house. When he saw what I had done to his parents, it broke me. Tears began streaming down my face, and I left as quickly and quietly as I could. I only made one stop before I left at the front patio. The boy, Jacob, dropped his toy airplane. I took it with me as a token of the day I ripped the innocence from that poor boy's life. I have never been able to listen to anything by Frank Sinatra since that day without having a panic attack of sorts. His parents were listening to him the night that everything happened. The song that was playing as I left and little Jacob arrived has been buried in my mind ever since. This is why this time of year is such a tragic reminder for me. Honestly, the rest of the year is never very easy either. Uh, there's nothing but painful memories, regret, and loneliness to keep me company. I stopped going to see my sister and everyone else from my family after I lost Margaret. After what I did. I didn't know if I just had never felt like I deserved happiness after that day. Or if I'm just too afraid that they will see me and they will know what I am. What I do know for sure, though, is that it is coming up on that time again. The anniversary of the day that I became a murderer. A murderer of murderers, sure. I may be a murderer of people who kidnap children and do God knows what to them. I guess I will never really know the full truth behind that part of it. All I can think of at this time of year, though, is the face on that poor little boy. The face he made when he saw them that scarred me for the rest of my life. I decided that I would call it a night. It might take me a while to get there, but I needed some rest. Sleeping well, Ronald. I woke up to this message in large letters across my computer screen. Someone had opened the notepad and left it there for me to see this morning. I'm not sure whether someone did this remotely or had come into my house while I was asleep. I was awake frequently throughout the night, so I had an inclination that they did it from somewhere else, or 
I would have seen them, but I can't be sure. A text message came through on my phone from an unknown number. Do you know what today is, Ronald? I'm not sure if it's just someone messing with me, but the fact that it is happening on the anniversary leads me to believe that it's not. From the other room, I can hear the TV switched on. It has a documentary on aviation play. It sounds about right. I'm starting to get older in age, but I always had a gut feeling that eventually this day would come. I have almost been waiting for it through all these years, I think. Sitting alone, hiding from society and the people I love. With this huge hole in my heart, it is hard to not feel like an empty shell waiting on my fate, my karma for what I had done. Memories began to flash through my mind. My loving wife, Carolyn, with her huge mum pinned to the shoulder of that puffy blue dress that she wore to our prom. The look in her eyes years later as I proposed to her in front of the beautiful sunset at the Garden of the Gods. The way that it felt as we stood with both of our families watching and we became man and wife. Finally, the feeling of loss as she left me but gave me Margaret, the best parting gift that could ever be given. Coming from the other room, I can hear someone approaching. They are making airplane noises with their mouth. I can see him standing at the doorway behind my recliner. His eyes are just barely above the area of the chair that is blocking my vision. He is a young man in his twenties. While locking his eyes with mine, he is continuing to make the airplane noise while moving the toy airplane from all those years ago into my line of sight and back out of it again. The plane is bobbing up and down as a child might do to show that it is flying. Hello, Jacob. I have been expecting you. Jacob nodded to me and dropped the toy airplane. He is not here to play toys with me, after all. His head ducked out of sight for a second. He must have been reaching down and behind him because I can see the shiny head of an axe beside his face now, inching his way closer. I release all my tension, feeling an overwhelming sense of calm and peace with the situation, as I sit back in my recliner and take a deep breath in. Jacob speaks out to me in a sing-song voice. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. I clicked the lock shut on the pastor's cage. We threw the body of his partner, Alan, in the cage across from him, and locked it for good measure. Abigail was busy unlocking the cages of the other girls who were being held hostage below the church. I called out to all the girls as I made my way to the stairs. Meet me up in the kitchen, everyone. It's about time we get some food in our stomachs. I made my way into the kitchen and placed my newly earned shotgun leaning against the wall right by the stove where I would be cooking. I turned on a couple of burners on the stove top and found two pans, putting them in place to let them start heating up. As I found a couple dozen eggs in the fridge, I heard everyone making their way up the stairs. Abby, will you see if there are any potatoes in that pantry over there, and start cutting them up if you find any? She nodded and went towards the pantry. As the rest of the girls filled in, she spoke to them. Y'all come in and take a seat. There are more chairs in the chapel if we need them. Let's see, there are five of you. Feels just like old times back in the bunker. Seven of us altogether. If one of you wants to help me chop up these potatoes, I would appreciate the help. My name is Abigail, but you can call me Abby. And this is my sister, Madison. We come from the same bunker. We barely escaped our mother sacrificing us for these crazy people. I would love to hear more about the rest of you while we work on getting some food ready. One girl followed Abby and searched for a couple of knives and cutting boards to help with the potatoes. She responded to Abigail as she did so. My name's Ada. She pointed to each other girls as she told us their names. This is Esther, Lee, Bethany, and Rebecca. We've all been down there for a while together now, though we all came from different, uh, what you call, bunkers as well. Esther and Leah are the only two like you who come from the same one. I started shaking my head in disbelief before replying to this statement. 
It is so unbelievable. I had a feeling when I saw all of you dressed like us down there that there must be more like ours. I just can't believe the scale of the deception. How long have they been doing this? How many poor young girls lost their lives before they were able to get away? Ada seemed very affected by my saying this, but began chopping potatoes, and responded anyway. Yes, I was the only one to make it out of my home. She paused to fight back the tears before continuing. I did not catch on to what was happening until it was too late. I was able to stop myself from drinking the poison, but the rest of my sisters drank every bit of it before I could stop them. My mother came at me with a knife and slashed me right here. She gestured to her shoulder, where we could see a bad wound coming out from under her dress. She was going for my throat, but I was able to fight the knife away from her and plunge it into her own. My poor sisters. I just can't stand to think of it. Bethany was able to sneak away without a deadly fight with her mother. Rebecca had to stop hers by strangulation. Both lost every sister to the poison and the ritual that accompanies it. Esther and Leah still have their sisters at their home, waiting for them. We have got to save them when we get out of here, if there is any way that we possibly can. Abigail shared her close run-in with the poison. Our mother knew I was onto her, and she tried to get me with some poison as well, a bottle of cyanide powder that she was going to mix into a drink for me. What is this about a ritual, though? We did not get to see any of that before we got away. We also have sisters to go back and save. Don't worry. We will all do everything in our power to save anyone still in one of those terrible places. I have a feeling that there may be even more of them out there than we know about. I finished the first pan of scrambled eggs and gestured for Leah to help me serve what was ready so that I could start on another pan. I dropped some butter into the other pan as Abby and Ada came over with the potatoes. They scraped them off the cutting board and into the sizzling pan. The rest of the girls were ravenously tearing into the first round of eggs when we heard the sound of the front door being kicked in savagely. I immediately grabbed a shotgun and motioned for the girls to take cover. I took a position at the wall that led into the chapel and poked my head around the corner very slowly. I saw two men, one older and one appearing to be in his thirties or so. They were both armed with handguns and had rifles strapped to their backs. I cocked the shotgun and made sure that it was ready to fire. They must have heard me doing this, because as I did, I heard the younger one shout out in anger. Drop your weapons immediately. We know everything you people are doing here. You give me any reason to, and I'm going to blow your brains all over this place. I made the inference that he was not here to harm us. It was still possibly a risk to trust these strangers, but I also would not be able to live with myself if I shot them down and they were here to help. I held the gun up vertically with one hand and put my other in the air and came around the corner slowly. I spoke in a slow and measured tone, making sure to let them know that if the feeling was mutual, I meant them no harm. My name is Madison. I'm here with six other girls. We were being held captive here by the pastor of this church and his partner. The men seemed to loosen up a bit, but did not lower their weapons yet. The older gentleman spoke to me in a more subdued and friendly tone. All right, Madison. Why don't we all just put our weapons down? We'd like to discuss some things with you and the other girls. The three of us lowered our firearms, and I gestured for them to follow me into the kitchen. I called into the kitchen to let them know that we were safe. They're not here to harm us, girls. It looks like we have two more that will be joining us at the table. Ada and Abigail took over the potatoes and eggs at the stove. I showed the two men to the table and sat across from them, eager to hear what their stories were. The older man was the first one to speak. Thank you for being hospitable after that rough entrance. Maybe we should start by introducing ourselves and telling you all a little bit about why we're here. My name is Ronald Sutherland. My daughter was kidnapped many years ago and I've come to learn that she was taken in by this horrible system that they have going here in Fern Hollow. I cringed at the name Sutherland, 
and gave Abigail a knowing glance. She dumped the eggs into a platter and rushed over by me and grabbed onto my arm. Ada began to split the eggs up into everyone's plates as the potatoes finished cooking. And I'm Jacob Asher, the uh, would-be murderer of Mr. Sutherland here. He patted Ronald on the back and smiled a somber and disheartened smile. He grabbed his shoulder and gave him a long and meaningful look before continuing. I was seconds away from taking an axe to him, the same way he did to my parents when I was a little boy. Something about how calm he was had distracted me. I had to know why he would do such a thing. He explained that his daughter, Margaret, was kidnapped by my parents, that his wife died in childbirth, and Margaret was the only thing he had left. I was destroyed to hear this about my mom and dad, but with time, I grew to learn that this was true, and that there was much more to it than just his daughter. This town, Fern Hollow, is a hub for human trafficking of young girls. It's not the usual kind that focuses on sexual slavery. These people have a strange fascination with occult human sacrifice. It's been going on for generations, and at this point, the entire town plays a part in it, as far as we can tell. Ada was passing out the potatoes now, and everyone had a full plate before them, everyone eating as much as they could stand. She took a seat at the other side of the table next to Esther and Leah. I was the first to respond to Jacob and Ronald. We've all seen different stages of this human sacrifice that you speak of. I looked towards Mr. Sutherland to begin to tear up. Sir, your daughter was the one that Abigail and I called mother. She raised us from the time that we presumably were snatched away from our families. The same way that she was taken from you. She loved and cared for us every day of our lives. I was crying harder now and doing my best to fight through it and finish what I had to say. I had to do it to get away. I didn't have any other way. I'm so sorry. Abigail was clutching me tightly, and I could feel that she was quietly sobbing as well. Ronald came around the table and held both of us. Don't worry, dear. I don't blame you. Not in the slightest. He backed away a bit and patted us both on the backs. We looked up to him, and he gave us a warm yet heart-wrenching smile. You know what it sounds like to me? It sounds like I'm finally getting the chance to meet my granddaughters. I'm just sorry that I couldn't be there for you sooner than this. Even though we were not biologically his, this meant more to us than he could ever know. After all that we had been through, it meant everything to know that we had someone who could look out for us. Someone who we could plan to try and make some kind of a life with when we made our way out of this mess. He pulled us in for one more embrace before heading back to his seat beside Jacob. Once there, he looked off into a corner, appearing to be very deep in thought. I'd often wondered what they'd gotten my sweet little Margaret mixed up into. I obsessed over it, honestly. I knew it was something sick and twisted. I could never have imagined something on this scale, though. Something so diabolical and wicked as this. I don't blame you girls for doing what you had to do so that you could gain your freedom. I like to hope that my Margaret was only doing what she had to so that these sick people would let her live. When I really think about it, I think that might be the same type of situation that Jacob's parents might have been in when they took my little girl from me all those years ago. It is hard in things so grand as this to find where the fault does indeed lie. I tend to believe it's some kind of evil incarnate, just attaching itself to every avenue it can, till it becomes like an epidemic. The forces of evil are at work in this world. That is undoubtedly true. Us here, in this room though, we are here to represent the forces of what is good, and what is right. We will not give in, and we will not say die. As long as a heartbeat pounds among us, the resistance will live on, and this thing will be wiped out for what they did to each and every one of us. They will pay, and they will pay dearly. The girls were getting pumped. Ronald's words were having a noticeable effect on the room. We were breathing heavier, fists clenched, and jaws tightened. 
I wiped the tears from my eyes. My sorrowful expression had been replaced with one of deep-seated rage, inspired by the impactful comments made by Ronald. We're ready. We have to get back our sisters. We have to do anything that we can to put a stop to this whole operation. I stood up from my chair and grabbed the shotgun. Everyone else followed suit, and Jacob passed his rifle to Abigail and his handgun to Ada. Ronald handed his rifle to Esther and his handgun to Leah. Ronald led the way towards the front of the church as Jacob explained the gesture. We have more firearms and ammunition in the vehicle. I'm hoping you all have the keys to that pickup out front. Yes, we got them off the pastor's crony, I answered. Ronald threw the front door open, and as soon as he did, the sound of a gun rang throughout the chapel. He gasped and grabbed at his chest, fighting to take in a breath but not quite able to. As we realized what was happening and began to back into a defensive position, another shot was fired as a red crimson mist came from the back of Mr. Sutherland's head. He fell back onto the floor. The blood began to pool around him. I couldn't believe what I just saw. I cocked the shotgun and stationed myself next to Bethany and Rebecca, who were, as of yet, unarmed. Esther came next to me, aiming her rifle over the top of the pew. Ada and Abigail stood side by side, along with Lee, in a crouched position, all of them aiming intently at the door of the church. Jacob had dropped low and pressed his back to the wall near the door when the shot was fired. Jacob had dropped low and pressed his back to the wall near the door when the first shot was fired. A voice came out from the doorway that had a deep southern twang to it. Now y'all don't try nothing stupid, girls. I know damn well y'all don't know how to use them things. This is Sheriff Hudson. Go ahead and give yourself up so we can end this here without any more bloodshed. I was fuming. I was so pissed off and infuriated that I couldn't even think straight. This man just came and took the last person who could have been a parental figure to me before I even got the chance to know him. I fired one shot through the open door and screamed at him. I cocked it and charged towards the door and shot again. This time as I shot, I heard a grunt from the other side. Jacob peeked around the corner to see how badly the sheriff was hit. When he did so, he was grabbed by the head and jerked to the ground. All of us came running to the door, and I reloaded my shotgun before cocking it and readying my aim. I led the way through the door, and we saw that the sheriff had a tight grip on Jacob. They were both on the floor, and I could see blood coming from the side of the sheriff where my shot had connected. Well, ain't this a surprise. I don't ever forget a resident of Fern Hollow, even one I ain't seen in decades. You girls go right on your way, or I blow the ash boy's head clean off. Understand? I knew he was bluffing, because keeping Jacob alive was the only thing that was standing between him and about five bullets going straight through him at one time. Each of us who were armed had our guns pointed directly at his head. Jacob coughed and pulled the sheriff's arm in an attempt to loosen his chokehold enough to speak to us. The keys are in the van. Take it and go. Move the stick to the letter D. He coughed and gagged as the sheriff pulled his hold tighter. Sheriff Hudson pulled back the hammer and shoved his six-shooter with more force into the side of Jacob's head. My patience is running out, so why don't you girls go ahead and do that before I paint the side of this church red. I motioned for the girls to head to the vehicles, keeping my shotgun pointed straight at the sheriff the whole time. They split up between the truck and the van. I started to back my way towards the van and called out to Jacob. We will be back for you. Stay strong. The van had four rows of seating and was stashed full of weapons just like they had said. In the front seat right by me was Abigail and Ada sat close behind. Bethany was in the back seat, rummaging through the weapons to find a gun that suited her. I cut on the engine and in the truck, Leah did the same. I looked around for the stick, and once I found it, I pulled it to the D. I looked towards Lee to make sure she had found hers. When she did, she looked up, and we nodded to each other, before kicking up dust behind us and heading back toward the direction of the bunkers. We'd be back for him, all right, and we would be back with an army.
The sheriff grabbed me by the collar after struggling to his feet. His six-shooter was held steadfast against the small of my back. Don't try nothing stupid, Ash. I'll put you down right by your old buddy here. He motions to the body of the man who had been the bane of my existence for most of my life. The man who murdered my parents, but who shed light on the reality of what is happening in this town for me. I felt the sheriff's spit hit the back of my neck as he continued speaking. I knew it was him that killed Andrew and Stephanie. Knew right from the jump. Just didn't care enough about your useless ma and pa to go looking for him. You know they fought us the whole way long about our little operation here. Probably would have been a couple turncoats as soon as they was able to. Hell, if we hadn't done what he did, they might be right here getting locked up with you. Rage pulsed through my body as I lashed out in anger, yelling at him and turning towards him. Don't you ever talk about my parents like that, you fucking hick. I'll make you regret everything you ever did to them. He shoved the pistol hard into my chest and grabbed his handcuffs with his free hand before replying. Yeah, yeah, you keep on talking, boy. I'm gonna put these on you. Don't want you acting like you're gonna try and wiggle free. I'm gonna need to use you to try and talk some sense into these little girls when they get back. I gave him my hands, knowing there was no way around it. He clicked the handcuffs down on my wrists and squeezed them extra tight once they were there. I felt them cutting into my wrists and stopped myself from making a noise or showing it on my face. I didn't want to give him the satisfaction. He laughed to himself about it anyway and led me forward through the door. We stepped over the body of my now late friend Ronald. The hobbled sheriff led me to the large cross at the front of the chapel and revealed a secret passageway leading down into a dungeon. As we made our way into the dank cellar that was full of cages, I saw one man moving about inside one. He called out to the sheriff. Sheriff Hudson, you must get me out of here. Those girls locked me in here and they killed Alan. The sheriff tossed open the door to the cage that was closest to the stairs and threw me into it. He slammed the door shut and locked it before slowly making his way over to the cage of the man who was calling out to him. He responded in a wavering voice. Yeah, then they came up and shot me on their way out of here. That's too bad about Alan, though. He was a hell of a guy, and a damn good poker player, too. We'll be missing him at the game on Wednesdays. Where do you keep the keys at, Pastor Robert? I got plenty more folks on the way to help put these girls back in their place. They took my keys with them, I assume, but Alan has a spare behind that loose stone in the corner over there. The sheriff wiggled the protruding stone out from the wall and pulled the shiny keys out from behind it. He tossed the stone to the floor, and grabbing at his wound, came back to let the pastor out of his cell. After he unlocked it, I noticed that he attached the key to his key ring on his belt. Let's go get you bandaged up, Sheriff. We have some first aid supplies and medicine to help relieve some of the pain. You can fill me in on how we will be restoring order to this. As you well know, it is time for the cycles to be completed and for the blood to be shed. These sick bastards were not going to get away with what they were planning. When they made their way in front of my cage, I spit at them both, and the Sheriff came thrusting at the cage. He was mouthing off to me and getting into my face. I pressed up against the cage, yelling at him, and continued to rile him up. I was shoving him and doing my best to distract him from the sleight of hand that was coming. He was so busy telling me off that he didn't even recognize when I snatched the keys away from him and hid them with the aid of my handcuffs. After a moment, the pastor and the sheriff made their way up the stairs, looking back at me disgustedly a couple of times as they did. I waited until I heard the door close shut at the top of the stairs and gave it a little bit of time just to make sure they didn't come back in for anything. Once I felt secure that they would not be coming back in, I found the smallest key and undid my handcuffs. As soon as those were loose, I dropped them to the floor and went straight for the lock to get myself out of the cage. My first stop was over to the cage that contained the body of the man that they called Alan. I rifled through his pockets and found a couple of items that would be worth stashing for the journey ahead. A large pocket knife and a lighter. After grabbing these, I walked over and grabbed the stone that the sheriff pulled out of the wall. 
I held it in my right hand and walked across the path between the cages and up the stairs to the secret door where the sheriff and pastor had just gone through. I leaned in close to try and hear any sign of the two, but was met with silence. They must have soundproofed the door, because the church was not large enough to explain my not being able to hear anything. I took a deep breath and considered my options. I tucked the stone under my arm and grabbed the pocket knife, flicking it out and revealing the rather large blade. Fuck it, I said to myself. I pushed the door open and quickly stuck my head through to scan the area. There was no sign of either the pastor or the sheriff, but I was pretty sure that I could hear them talking to each other in the kitchen. On top of that, I was hearing what sounded like more vehicles arriving in front of the church. All I had to do was make it to the sheriff's patrol car that was parked either on the side of the building or around back. There was a door on the side of the church across the wall from the kitchen and what appeared to be a bedroom. It appeared to be one that would lead outside and hopefully out of sight of whoever was showing up to rally behind the two leaders of the operation. I knew I had to move quickly, so I slid out of the door and ran over to the front pew and crouched down in front of it. I made it down just in time before an influx of people came piling in from outside. I felt the sweat begin to fill my palm and beat up on the back of my neck. I stayed low, ensuring that my head was not in sight. It must have been over a dozen people. They looked like the definition of an angry mob. I closed the knife and tucked it into the side of my shoe to hide it in case I was captured again. After that, I sat the stone on the pew in front of me and waited anxiously for something to happen. I heard the pastor and the sheriff come out from the kitchen and the sheriff spoke out to the group. Thank y'all for joining us in such short notice. We've been into a bit of an issue with the girls, but it ain't nothing we can't handle. The girls escaped but we got their friend locked up down there. Most of y'all should remember the Ash family, the axe murderers from our own little town here. We have the boy, Jacob, restrained and ready to be used against them in any way we need to. Hopefully, we can use him to get the girls to turn themselves over. If not, though, I got no problems putting his head on a stick to show them girls who they're messing with. I lost my footing as I heard this and shuffled in place only slightly. It was enough to draw attention as I heard the pastor hush the room and speak quietly. Did anyone else hear that? I think that it came from the pews. I could not see where they were all looking, but I knew I had to think quickly. I picked the stone up from the pew and chucked it underhanded into the open door that led into a bathroom. At the sound of this, all the people charged to find the cause of the noise. I used this opportunity to move quickly and as silently as possible over to the door on the side of the church. I opened it and slid out without anybody in the mob taking notice. The sheriff's car was not on this side of the building. That meant that it had to be either around the back or on the other side. I had to find it to get away. I was hoping his keys to the car were on the same ring that I was able to snatch away from him. Definitely not a sure thing, as he had just fished them out of the wall, but I didn't have many options. I began to head towards the back of the building when two people came around the corner. They were startled at first, but quickly drew their weapons. Each of them pulled out a pistol and pointed it directly at my chest. It was a man and a woman that appeared to be middle-aged, roughly the same age as my late friend Ronald, if I had to guess. The man spoke to me in a steady tone. That's far enough. Put your hands up, and we're going to bring you in to see the pastor, all right? No need to do anything we'll both regret. The lady was looking at me intently and had a look of confusion on her face. She leaned towards the man and whispered into his ear. I couldn't hear anything that she said, but I could hear him replying in a hushed tone. What? No, there's no way. That's impossible. He took me by the arm and led me gently toward the church and back toward the group that I had so narrowly escaped just a moment ago. My head and shoulders sunk. I knew I could still have a chance to get away at some point, but they would likely have me guarded now, and it would be significantly harder to accomplish. The lady spoke as we entered the church. Sheriff Hudson, we found this gentleman outside looking rather shady and sneaking about. The crowd of people had made their way back into the chapel, and the sheriff and pastor were at the front of the pack. 
Everyone looked over in astonishment as the woman alerted them to our presence. The sheriff charged over and grabbed me roughly by the elbow. He got within an inch from my face and growled out a vicious warning. You pull one more stunt like that, and I'll blast your brains all over this place, Ash. A look of recognition came over the faces of the two people who had captured me on my way out. They looked towards each other with a knowing glance, and the woman grabbed onto the man's arm. The sheriff continued his tirade. Now, why don't you hand over whatever you use to get yourself out of those cuffs, before I change my mind and paint this place red right now. I slowly reached and took out the keys that I had taken from him in the cellar. He couldn't believe his eyes, and quickly reached down to the area where he had kept them on his belt, patting away furiously. Now, how in the heck did you get those away from me? You slippery little. You know what? Give me those. He angrily snatched the keys out of my hand and shot me a glance that looked as if he had a fire burning within his eyes. He grabbed me by the collar, and just as he was about to spew more venom straight into my face, the man who caught me outside spoke up and caught the sheriff's attention. Sheriff, I know Pastor Roberts and you were busy getting everyone lined out. Why don't you let me take care of this one? Sarah and I will apply his restraints and stay with him in the cellar to ensure that there is no chance he will wiggle free again. The sheriff loosened his grip and sat for a moment, stewing in his anger. The pastor came over and patted him on the shoulder, and he responded to the man's request. That will be very good, Matthew. Thank you for the kind offer. We have much left to go over with the rest of these fine folks, and we will be happy to fill you two in as soon as we get the chance. The sheriff gave me one last look that could kill, and shoved me hard, releasing my shirt as he did. He gave the two a curt nod, and turned off back towards the group of people with the pastor close behind him. They each held one of my arms, and we made our way back to the cellar behind the giant cross. As we entered the stairway, they closed the hidden door behind us. We walked down the stairs and through the walkway between all the cages. I was confused when they kept walking me past all the cages and to the back of the room. They stopped at the wall near the area that I had picked up the stone that the sheriff put out to reveal the key earlier. When we stopped there, they both released me and stood together, looking at each other before the woman asked me a question. Your name is Jacob Ash, isn't it? I looked at the two of them and nodded slowly, unsure of what that could mean to them. She appeared as if she knew this was the case and confirmed. My name is Sarah, and this is my husband's, Matthew. We were best friends with your mother and father. They were good people, and they never wanted to be a part of any of this. Many of us never did. We are forced to adhere to the demands of the sheriff and the pastor. Those of us who question this or try to fight against the way of Fern Hollow are tortured or murdered. They are very public about setting these examples so that the rest of us get the message. Matthew and I, we never had kids of our own. We cherished you as a child, though. We were always babysitting you and playing with you when we came to visit your parents. You were like the baby we never had, and it came as no surprise when your parents asked us to be your godmother and godfather. My jaw dropped when I heard this, and they came in to embrace me. They both held me close for a moment and squeezed my back tightly. I was in shock at this revelation. Before I was able to take it all in, Matthew gave me a firm pat on the back, and they both released me as he spoke to both of us. We're going to have to meet up with the girls who escaped to join forces with them. It is going to take as many of us as we can get to take down these sick people. We're going to need a diversion when we get out. They can't notice that we're getting away or it will ruin everything. This is going to be incredibly dangerous, but now that you are here, it is something that we have no choice in. We will stick by your side the whole way through, and we will fight against this evil with everything we have in us. Matthew reached for a stone that was near the stone that hid the key before. He was struggling with it, and spoke in frustration. I need something to wedge this free. They obviously have not used this in quite some time. I reached into my shoe and took out the knife, handing it to him to use. He used it to pry the stone free, and then it pulled out and revealed a handle 
causing the wall to reveal a door that led to some wooden stairs and a hatch at the back of the building. He gave me the knife back before we all made our way up and out to the back, closing the secret door behind us. This place is like the H.H. H. Holmes murder castle, I muttered quietly while sticking close behind. They had a 4x4 vehicle with large tires very close to where we came out from the back of the church. I had to think of a way to make a diversion to draw attention away from the vehicle starting. Then we could get to kicking up dust and finding the girls. After we teamed up to come back, we could take the fight to them in full force. I looked all around the sides of the church, and it hit me, as I looked at one side that had loose hay stacked high on the side of the building. I dug into my pocket and found the lighter that I had taken off the dead man's body in the cellar before. I flicked open the lid to it and looked to my newly discovered godparents to give them some warning. Y'all go ahead and hop in the car. I'm going to send this church back to hell where it came from. That should give us a pretty good distraction, and it's what this place deserves, and then some. Matthew nodded at me approvingly, and the two of them hopped into the car waiting to turn it on until I got back from starting the blaze. I walked over to the pile of hay with the lighter's lid flickered back, and I looked at the side of the building in disgust. How many poor young girls had their life taken in this church? How many were tortured and forced to turn against everything they had ever stood for? A deep and overbearing sense of darkness came over me as the thought flashed through my head, and for a moment... I wept inside with all of those girls. I felt the pain that this place had caused them, and I would deliver the retribution to the building that housed all that pain. I struck the lighter, and the flame was lit. I touched the flame to a few different areas on the dry hay, and then placed it in the middle of the pile, and watched as it began to roar into a large and unforgiving blaze. Matthew cut on the engine as I ran up to the vehicle and Sarah reached back and threw open the back door so that I could jump into it on the run. We drove away as the side of the building went up in flames, and I looked back in amazement. They would pay for all they had done, and we would make sure that they were never able to do it to anyone ever again. As we drove farther and farther away from the flames, I let myself fall lax across the back seat, exhausted. Before I realized what was happening, I drifted off into a deep and restful sleep. We pulled up to the first bunker, which I recognized as my own, the one that just a short time ago I thought was the only one like it in the world. I had a pretty good grasp on how to make the van stop and slow down at this point. I struggled for a moment while figuring out how to park it, though, and saw that Leo was having a time with it as well. Once we did, we all began to file out of the vehicles and form as a group in between them both. The rest of the girls came out of the vehicles armed with weapons. The only two who did not were Abigail and me. I held my hand up in caution to the group while placing my other hand on the shoulder of Leah, who was closest to me in the group. There will be no need for weapons here. This is our family. If it makes you feel safer, though, please feel free to wait out here with the vehicles and keep watch in case anyone comes from the town. I'm sure the sheriff will be gathering his people to make a stand against us. In response to this statement, the girls gathered together, talking amongst themselves before turning their attention back to me. After they discussed for a moment, Ada spoke for the rest of them. The rest of the girls want to take the van and go rescue Leah and Esther's sisters. I would like to stay here with you two, and maybe go in with you to meet the rest of your family. Would that be okay with you? I looked towards Abigail, who was nodding her head in agreement, and then responded to Ada. Of course that would be fine. We all just need to meet back up here, since we will not know where exactly to find them. Y'all come back this way whenever you get your sisters, and we will get ready to head back and take down that wicked town. Also, be sure to leave some of the weapons and supplies in case we get separated for too long, and the townspeople catch up with us. They nodded in agreement and said their goodbyes before piling into the van and stopping by the truck to put some guns, ammunition, and various other things into the back seat and trunk bed. Abigail walked up closer to me, 
and I could feel her uneasiness as she began to stare towards the hatch that we both escaped from. I grabbed Abby's hand, and we walked towards the hatch as Ada followed us close behind. The visions started running through my mind the closer we got. My mother coming up behind me, revealing what she was going to do to all of us, and finally cracking my stone against mother's skull. I reached into my pocket and felt my stone that was just like the one that Abigail kept on her, and the picture that I would have to show to the rest of our sisters while I explained what happened. We reached the hatch. Abigail and I exchanged our last look of concern before letting go of each other's hands. I reached down and started to spin the wheel that would open the door and let us down into my mother's closet. There was a pin pad on this side of the door that was just like the one I used to escape from the other side. I typed in 1313 and gained access to the closet. Me, Abigail, and Ada stepped through, pushing clothes to the side as we made our way into the bunker. We walked into Mother's room. There was a stain on the floor where I left her lying there that fateful day. I shuddered as I saw it, and the girls noticed and came to my side. Abby held me tight, and Ada put her head on my back. I wiped the tears that had welled up in my eyes and squeezed their hands. It was finally time to see my sisters again. The kitchen was empty, but I could hear Wendy in the living room. She was speaking incoherently and sounded restless and weary. There was an eeriness to her voice that I don't believe I had ever heard before. I could not make out many of the words that she was saying, just a few here or there between a bunch of raspy muttering. I called out to her as we crossed through the kitchen. Wendy, it's us, Madison and Abigail. I'm sorry it took so long to... When I saw what awaited us in the living room, I couldn't bring myself to finish my sentence. Abigail screamed out in horror and grabbed onto me. I stared in awe and heard Ada whispering, Oh my God, from behind us. Their heads were placed on the tops of wooden crosses. Clarissa, Chastity, Gretchen, and Mildred. My sweet sisters were gone forever. They were surrounding a golden offering plate in the middle of the floor. In it were four hearts and four vials of blood. I ran up to Wendy, who was sitting against the wall with a faraway stare, shaking her by the shoulders. Wendy, what happens here? I stopped Mother. She wasn't supposed to be able to do this. I took out the picture of the previous sisters who our mother had sacrificed and handed it to her. Abigail found this right before we both went missing. She wasn't supposed to be able to complete the cycle. I stopped her. How did this happen? Wendy was unresponsive at first, but after a moment, a look of recognition began to come over her. She looked at me and back towards Abigail. All at once, she broke down, heaving her chest and sobbing uncontrollably. The guttural sounds coming from her reminded me of a hurt animal wailing. She was so lost in her sorrow that it took quite some time before we were able to talk to her at all. I held her close, and my dress became wet with her tears. When she was finally able to muster the resolve to speak, she spoke pathetically in a quiet and heartbroken tone. It was me. I jumped back from her covering my mouth and sliding away on the floor to put some distance between us. Ada and Abigail were just as horrified to hear what she had revealed and came close behind me. We all just looked at her and the carnage she created for a moment, mortified. How and why could Wendy have done something this horrible to our beloved sisters? Why? I asked. It was all I could think of to ask. Wendy sat there for a moment, gathering her thoughts, her eyes wet, and her face drenched. She looked as if it was the last thing she wanted to think about, but she gathered herself and looked towards us to tell the tale. I was the first to find Mother after you left her the way you did. I thought she was surely dead, and I held her in my arms, crying out to God. In what I thought was a miracle, but in hindsight was a terrible curse. She lifted her eyes and had a small bit of life left in her. She told me about the ritual, 
the virgin sacrifices, and what the purpose of our entire lives had been. She said that since I was the one who found her, I could take her place as the mother of this place, that I could continue the divine purpose and fulfill the wishes of our God who provides for the world. She told me where to find the tome that contained the ritual. She left it up to me to continue her legacy, and she passed away in my arms. This part of the story was affecting Wendy greatly. She paused for a moment. I felt the urge to pat her on the back and let her know it was all right, but I was so repulsed by what was being revealed that I just sat back in shock so that she could finish her story. I've always done exactly as Mother wished. I could not let her dying wish go unanswered. After all, the poison would kill them before they would be able to feel more grotesque parts of the right. They were raving thoughts of a girl gone mad with grief. I now know. I feel so terrible now. I don't have any idea if what I did even worked. There was no message from God or bright lights letting me know that what I did was accepted by him. Just this horrible scene that you see in front of you. Abigail came forward and sat on her knees in front of Wendy. She placed one hand on her shoulder and looked her squarely in the eyes. Wendy, what you did was completely despicable. I may never be able to fully forgive you for this, and this will be my own struggle that I must fight within myself. For you, though, I want you to take this. Abigail handed her the stone that was just like mine, the one that matched mine and always served as a reminder of our close friends as sisters that we were not perfect, nor would we ever be. John 8-7 So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin amongst you, let him first cast a stone at her. Wendy took the stone and held it close to her chest. She broke down, crying again, and we all surrounded her in a tight embrace. I had never felt so many different emotions in my life. I was hurt, confused, in disbelief, glad to be in the presence of my sister, yet hating her all at one time. Wendy, I don't know how I will be able to live with what you have done, but you are my sister, and I love you. You can start to try to make things right by coming with us to fight against the people who are spreading all of this evil. I motions to the heads of my sisters that sat just feet away from us. Wendy looked towards Abigail and me and gave me a determined nod. We grabbed her hands and pulled her to her feet. I took one last, disgusted look at the evil deed that had been carried out in my own home, the place that I had spent every day of my life. I shuddered and looked back towards Ada, Abigail, and Wendy. We should get on top and wait for the rest of the girls. I can't stand to be down here any longer. We all walked towards Mother's room and made our way back to the closet that would lead us back to the surface. I was the first to go up the ladder and lift the hatch. I was met with the cold barrel of a shotgun being shoved against my forehead and the voice of a lady who threatened me in a deadly serious tone. I know you girls have Bethany with you. I need her to complete my ritual. Don't think for a second I will let you leave alive until I have her. Go ahead and climb out slowly. The first one of you that tries to make a move will be dead before you hit the ground. We did as we were told, and came out from the bunker one by one. We stood beside each other, and in front of the incensed woman, her fury only growing hotter as she realized that Bethany was not one of the girls who made their way out. This had to be her mother that she was telling us about back at the church. You girls think I'm playing with you? I know she's down there, and she better come out. Ada responded, though her voice was trembling. She isn't here. They left to try and find more sisters to join us. The lady smirked. Well, isn't that convenient? 
Sounds like I might have to tie three of you up, and get one of you to show me the way, then. Or I could always shoot you down where you stand, if anyone objects to that. Abigail responded to this statement. We don't know where they went. They said that they would meet us back here. We've never been to any other bunkers besides this... Ada cut me off. It's fine, Abby. I come from another bunker, and I think that I know the way to where they were going. Let me be the one to bring this woman where she intends to go. I looked at Ada warily, and did not feel good about what she was suggesting. Still, I did not see many options that would end with us alive for much longer. So we had to agree. The woman pointed the rifle at Ada and backed slowly towards the truck. She reached in the bed and revealed a substantial length of rope and tossed it at her feet. Tie up the other three, back to back, and good and tight. Don't think I'm not going to go check to see if you leave it loose for them. Ada picked up the rope and walked it over to us. She apologized and tied the rope fairly tight, putting us all in a triangle shape with our backs pressed against each other. As she finished, she stood up beside us and waited for the woman to come and check as she said. She came over and made sure that there was no way we were getting out of our situation. Satisfied with the job that was done, she turns to Ada. All right, hop in the passenger seat. We need to get moving. They walked over to the truck and hopped in on either side. An overwhelming feeling of helplessness began to overtake me as the woman started the truck. The rope felt much too tight for us to be able to escape. Even if we did, she was taking off with all our supplies, our vehicle, and Ada. Who knows what she would do to her when they arrived at their destination. My thoughts were interrupted by the sound of a gunshot. Blood splattered into the driver's side window, and their adventure was over before it could even begin. Ada stepped out of the passenger side after cutting the engine and came straight over to let us loose. Sorry to worry you girls. I snuck a handgun into my dress when we were about to get into your bunker. I know you asked me not to, but after all that we've been through, I just thought it was safer to be prepared. I hope you aren't too offended by that. The rope stopped digging into my wrists, and we were all quickly set free and able to get to our feet. I dusted myself off and responded to what Ada said. Are you kidding? Thank you so much for thinking ahead. I was naive to think that everything would just go smoothly after everything that's happened. Abigail shouted out in a panicked tone. There's a vehicle heading this way, and it's not the van. Everybody grab a weapon, now! Wendy, Abby, Ada, and I dashed in a frenzy over to the truck. I went up to the driver's side and opened the door, letting the body of Bethany's mother fall to the dirt. We all shuffled through the back seats and the bed of the truck to arm ourselves and take defensive positions as the vehicle made its way near. A cloud of dust kicked up as the vehicle pulled up and came to a stop. We all had our guns cocked and ready and pointed them directly at it. I yelled out a warning as I saw the back door come open first. Don't even think of trying anything. We have you in our sights, and we're ready to fire. The young man who stepped out caused all of us to let out a collective sigh of relief. It was Jacob Ash. He raised his hands and spoke calmly and reassured us that he was there in good company. Hey, girls, it's all right. I'm here with two people we can trust. They helped me escape from the church, and from what they tell me, they're also my godparents. We came to help y'all go back and take down the sheriff. As he finished explaining himself, he lowered his hands slowly and an older man and woman stepped out of the vehicle. They waved to us and gave us friendly yet pained smiles that were as warm and inviting as the situation could allow. We waved them over and showed them to our stash of weapons and supplies that were really Jacob's in the first place. They each grabbed what they could, and Abby explained to them what we were to do next. The rest of the girls went to go find Leah and Esther's sisters. We will need to wait for them here, or go and see if they need to be rescued if it starts taking too long. This is Wendy, by the way. She's Madison and I's sister. She didn't mention anything about what we had just discovered in our own bunker, and I did not intend to be the one to bring it up. Jacob nodded politely and waved to Wendy, who looked as shell-shocked as when we found her. She made a slight gesture 
and went to sit in the truck alone. After we were all prepared, we began to talk amongst each other and make necessary introductions. We were starting to worry about the rest of the girls. As we began to discuss what we were going to do if they needed to be rescued, I saw a familiar van approaching from across the plains. All three vehicles were loaded with people who were armed and ready for war. Now that we had three experienced drivers on the team, we had each of them driving a different one. Jacob drove the van that he and Ronald found us at the church in. His godfather, Andrew, drove the truck that Alan brought me to the church in. His godmother, Stephanie, drove her own 4x4 vehicle that they had just used to save Jacob. Leah and Esther's sisters were enthusiastic about joining our side in the fight. They were as shocked as all of us had been to discover the truth behind their mother and the place that they had called home for all this time. Their names were Helen, Marjorie, Rose, Annie, and Margaret. We told them that we were all sisters now, and that after this battle, we would all be one big family, looking out for each other the rest of the way. I was in the truck with Jacob driving. Abby sat in the front seat with me, and Wendy, Bethany, and Ada were in the back. No, I don't blame you. Not one bit. I would have done the same thing if she was able to find me. Bethany was reassuring Ada, who felt conflicted about having just killed the one that Bethany had called Mother. Ada responded, sounding down regardless of Bethany's helpful words. Thank you. It's just so crazy, though, isn't it? We lived with these psychopaths our entire lives, and then it turns out that they were never even who they pretended to be. It's just kind of hard to wrap your mind around. Wendy stared off blankly. She hadn't looked right since we found her in the bunker, like something had snapped inside of her after what she did, and she was just reliving it over and over. Indoctrinating can be a terrible thing in the worst of circumstances, and Wendy was proof that this was true. She followed everything our mother wanted blindly and submissively. If only we were able to understand earlier who it was that we were dealing with. Maybe the tendrils that she wrapped so deeply around Wendy's mind would not have been strong enough to drag her into this hell they created. Jacob explained what was happening to Abby and me. I set fire to the church on our way out of there. Hopefully it went all the way to the ground, but even if it didn't, that should have sent them scrambling to readjust. If we can catch them while they're still on their heels, it would be a huge advantage. I hope it burned all the way down with every one of them in it, I said, hatefully. They may not be as bad as you think. It's crazy how far people will go when they're being ordered to do so. I've read about Stanley Milgram, who did some experiments in the 60s that showed people are willing to do some messed up things when it comes to obedience to authority, especially when they think it's for the greater good. I didn't have anything to say back to that statement by Jacob, although it did not change how I felt about them, to be honest. The anticipation of what we were about to do started to set in, and we all grew quiet. Determination, fear, and a variety of other emotions ran through us as we awaited our fate. There was no telling how many of us would die, or if we had the necessary firepower to take down the sheriff and his people. I sat with my thoughts for what seemed like an eternity. On the horizon, I saw the smoldering shell of what once was the church where we had all been held captive. Smoke was rising from the ashes, and I couldn't help but grin as I looked to Jacob. Serves them right. I hope some of their people are in there with Ronald. Jacob nodded sullenly and pulled the car to a stop. He spoke to everyone in the vehicle and reached for his weapon. We need to come over the area and look for any sign of where they all went. Stay vigilant. They're most likely expecting us to return here and could be camped out from any side. Let's go together and have the rest of the group stay behind in case of an ambush. We don't want them taking our vehicles or supplies. Jacob agreed, and we explained our plan to the rest of the group who armed themselves and prepared to defend their positions. Jacob asked Matthew and Sarah to explain how to correctly work the firearms to each of the girls, and then walked up with a handgun for each of us. This is the magazine. Here are some extras to keep on you in case you run out of bullets. You release it right here and just pop the next one right in. This part's called the slide. 
You just pull it back and then aim it when you want to shoot and pull the trigger. This is the safety. Make sure it's off if you're ready to fire. I shot back at him more kidding than anything. Did you not see the shot I hit the sheriff with? I think I'll be fine. Thanks for the info, though. It really was just dumb luck. Let's see if there's any part of the building that isn't burnt to a crisp. We made our way to the smoldering building, and I noticed the area where Ronald Sutherland's body lay was completely caved in and covered in ash and charred wood. We were going to avenge his death, and he would be happy to know that his tomb was the destroyed remains of the heart and soul of this damned city. Around the corner revealed more of the same. It appeared that they either did not attempt to put the flames out, or otherwise might have failed miserably in trying to do so. The whole building was leveled and burned to the ground. It was difficult to tell if there were any casualties. We would have to do some digging to find that out. Before I could suggest that we snoop around a bit, I heard Jacob call out enthusiastically. We have to check the basement with the cages. If anything would have survived, it's in the room down there. I know an entrance around back. Follow me. As we stepped up to the doors that led down into the basement, I felt my adrenaline begin to rush. I made sure that my gun was ready to fire as Jacob pulled open the hatch and stepped onto the wooden stairs. I had not noticed a door when I was in the cages with Abigail and the rest of the girls. It had to be a secret door that was built into the stone wall. I followed close behind and watched him push open the door that presumably led into the cellar. The opening of the door was met with an almost instantaneous, loud, booming gun blast from within. Jacob grabbed his leg and fell back against the stairs. I quickly closed the door so no further shots could come through the stone wall on the other side. Shit! He took a second to catch his breath and gain his composure before continuing. We have to advance carefully. This is the only way in, so they will be ready for almost any move we make. He pulled out a blade from his pocket and cut off the length of his shirt to tie tightly around his fresh wound. As I caught a glimpse of the knife, I responded with a gleam in my eye. Besides a surrender? What? No. We would never. We've come too far to do that. Come on. I have a plan. This is our only way in without a new hole in the head. I cracked the door ever so slightly and called out to whoever was inside. Listen, we're willing to give ourselves up. We have a lot of backup waiting for us, and taking the two of us alive will give you an incredible edge in bargaining with the rest of the girls. I heard a voice reply that I would know anywhere. The icy, cold voice of the pastor of this desecrated church. That's all right, Madison. You two just go ahead and slide your guns across the floor nice and far. Understand that if you make one false move, Sheriff Hudson has you dead to rights and will not hesitate to eviscerate both of you. I pushed the door open just a bit more and slid my gun across the floor, then reached back to Jacob's before doing the same. He forced himself to his feet and was able to put pressure on the leg that had been shot. After making sure that he would be all right to continue, I pushed the door open slowly and proceeded into the cellar with Jacob limping close behind. The room was empty, other than the pastor and sheriff, which was just as I had hoped. The sheriff turned bright red and yelled at Jacob and me. You're gonna regret what you did to this place, Ash. Our people already got those girls surrounded by now. And when I turn the one who burned their beloved church over to them, they're gonna get real creative with you. Same goes for you, girl. You're the reason we got this whole mess on our hands. Now both of you stay right there and keep your hands where I can see them. The sheriff held a shotgun trained directly at Jacob, and the pastor pointed a rifle right between my eyes. They approached us slowly, and the pastor spoke to us in a calm and measured tone. All right, you two turn around and stay close. We're going to bring you up to the battlefield now, and if you make the slightest wrong move, it will be the last move that you make. We did as they said, and I felt the cold steel of the pastor's rifle dig hard into the small of my back. They led us up the stairs and around the burnt building. The scene before us was much like the sheriff had described in the cellar. Our crew was defending their positions, but there were vehicles and people around them from all sides. Both groups had enough firepower to blow this place to hell, but it looked like we were outnumbered. 
The standoff was tense. As we made it to the group, the sheriff began to speak in a cold, incalculated demeanor. We're through playing with you girls. This is where we finish the job that your lousy mother couldn't get done. The time to turn yourself over is finished. This is an execution, and each one of you is going to watch the next one pay for crossing us. Ask Lester over here how he did his family, when they thought they were going to leave Fern Hollow and let the next town over know about what we got going over here. He gestured to an old man who held a revolver, but averted his attention when the sheriff made this remark. Or Marjorie over there. Why don't you ask her about her little bastard of a son who thought he was going to be a hero and stop the whole damn thing himself? The middle-aged woman took a deep breath, and her hands began to shake noticeably as the sheriff nodded towards her. That's right. Pathetic. We don't tolerate that type of business here, and this operation's much bigger than any one of us. The pastor interjected at what he seemed to think was a great point. Indeed. It is a divine mission that has been given to all of us. We must succeed, or we fail the very god of our existence. My attention was drawn towards Wendy. She was looking around shiftily and behaving strangely. There are times when things seem to go in slow motion. It might be because that moments will be played back over and over in your head for the rest of your life. It's like it's your mind's way of letting you know that something important is happening. There was a time before this thing happened, and everything else will be the time after. A pivotal moment. I'm really not sure the reasoning, but at that moment, everything seems to become still and quiet, other than what was happening before my eyes. Wendy held the handgun with both hands and jerked it away from the townspeople of Fern Hollow. She pulled it back towards the area of friendly fire. When I saw who it was that she was turning the gun towards... I felt my heart drop to my feet, and I called out to my sister. Abigail! It was the last time I was ever able to see that look of reaction on her face. She heard my voice and looked towards me, but as she did, Wendy fired two rounds into the side of her head. My sorrow was replaced with adrenaline as she turned towards me. One more sister, and the cycle is complete. I will make the best mother that this town has ever seen, Madison. She was cut short by a shotgun blast to the back from Ada. Blood ran from her mouth as she dropped her weapon and then fell to her knees before falling flat in the dirt. During all of the commotion, the pastor and sheriff had taken their guns off the backs of Jacob and myself and pointed them at the crowd. I looked towards Jacob and whispered, Jacob, your knife! He wasted no time and reached down to reveal the blade, while turning quickly and shoving it straight under the sheriff's chin and straight into his brain. I had run my hand into my pocket and found my stone while he finished the sheriff off and ducked around the rifle that the pastor was swinging towards Jacob. As I did, I leaned back and put all my weight into a swinging bash against the pastor's temple. He fell to the ground and dropped his rifle. I picked up the rifle and shot the man right between his eyes. The blood formed a pool underneath his head. I looked up, and there was a handful of townspeople approaching with weapons drawn. We had no way to escape to the rest of our group, so I placed the gun down and held my hands up. Jacob had dropped his knife and held a similar position just feet away. The two masterminds and overlords lay dead before us. I noticed one of the men approaching us as Lester, who the sheriff had spoken of before his demise. He looked towards the bodies on the ground, looked towards the two of us, and then he threw his gun onto the ground. The rest of the group hesitantly kept their guns pointed straight at us until the woman, who the sheriff had called Marjorie, stepped forward and threw her gun to the ground as well. She grabbed on to Lester, and the two of them wept. I still don't know if they were tears of joy at the deaths which had happened, or tears of grief for their loved ones who were lost. The rest of the townspeople followed suits one by one and threw their weapons before them at their feet. After all of them had disarmed and stood down, the girls from our side and Jacob's godparents began to do the same as well. Once I was sure that the standoff was over, I ran to my fallen sisters. I fell to the ground 
and held on to both of their bodies tightly. My chest was heaving, and I could not control the sobs that were coming. I backed up and looked at what they had become, what this place had done to them, and thought of what I could have done differently to save them from this terrible fate. I reached into Wendy's pocket and found the matching stone that was just like mine, which Abby had given her after we discovered the horror that she unleashed within the bunker. I held it by mine, which was covered in blood, both dried and fresh. After I pressed them to my head for a moment to take in the weight of the moment, I placed Abigail's stone on Wendy's chest and my own stone on Abby's. As I looked into the sky, taking everything in, I was rushed and embraced by the girls, Michael and Sarah. They were cheering as they hoisted me up and hollered loudly. We had done it, after all. We had achieved what each one of us had set out to do, although there had been much pain and suffering along the way. As they turned me around, I caught a glimpse of Jacob as he stood there, propping himself up to take the pressure off his wounded leg. He saw me look at him, and he smiled. Although I hadn't been able to up until then, something about his smile gave me enough joy that I could smile back. After all this time, it was done. We could finally see what was outside of this godforsaken town.